Hi Year 12. Hope everyone's alright. Welcome to the second video lesson. So again we are going to be continuing section 4.5 which is all about turning points. So given that there was no emails sent to me over the last week asking for any kind of help, my assumption is that everyone is totally fine with what they saw in the previous video. I've also marked everyone's home learning. It was generally very well done. Uh, top mark of 22 out of 25, which was uh, excellent. And uh, what I'm going to do in this video is we're going to continue into section 4.5. So we'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how to answer questions from exercise 4.5b. But to begin with, I'm going to go through the home learning questions. Now, there will be timestamps in the description. So if you don't need to watch me go through question one or watch me go through any of the questions, please feel free to check out the description and click ahead. That being said, every person needs to make sure that they've watched the, uh, the walkthrough to question four. So with that out of the way, this is how the video is going to start. I'm going to go through the home learning questions. I'm just going to answer the questions. So we've got all of these and if necessary, I can put in blank slides in case I run out of room. Then the rest of the video, I will talk a little bit about, well, more stuff from the book and finish it off with talking about exercise 4.5b. I'll mention now that there is a new home learning, so I will email this out to you as well. The home learning is uh, due on Thursday. So if you're in school, you'll bring it with you uh, on paper. If you're not in school, then I expect it to be emailed to me by the beginning of period six on Thursday, the 22nd of October, 2020. So it's basically the continuation of the worksheet. So the, the previous homework was questions one, two, three, and four. This homework is questions five, six, and seven. And as you can see, it's about stationary points and the nature of stationary points and things like that. So the, some of these things I'll actually talk about in this video. So yeah, that's uh, that's the new homework. So I will send this to you separately as well. So don't don't feel as though you have to pause the video and do it, do a screenshot or anything like that. Okay, I'm gonna email you that. I'll also mention that again at the end of the video. Okay, so to get started then, I'm gonna go through question one. So uh, part one, we have to work out what y dashed is. I suppose we could also write dy by dx. So maybe we. Maybe we should write that. So dy by dx. So you have to multiply by the power and knock one off the power. So times by four and then knock one off the power. So four x cubed. Uh, two x, the gradient of that is just two. Also, it was really a two to, an x to the one and one times two is two. And then the power goes down to a zero. And then x to the zero is just one. So you end up with two times one, which is two. And then lastly, three times three is nine, and you knock one off the power to leave you with uh, minus nine x squared. So dy by dx is four x cubed plus two minus nine x squared. Right, number two. Okay, so in number two, you need to get rid of the fact you're doing a division here because we can't differentiate a fraction yet where we've got some x's on the top and x's on the bottom that's something that you'll learn about in year 13 so for now the kind of questions that you'll be asked for example with number two and with number three they're simple enough for you to just actually do the division and just write it out without any division in it so um we're going to re rewrite y as y equals three over root x plus 2x over root x, right? If you think about it, this has a common, de common denominator of root x, and you would just add the numerators up. So I've kind of split this fraction up as to the sum of two individual fractions. This is 3 over x to the half plus 2x over x to the half. And then we'll use our index laws to simplify this. So this is 3x to the minus a half because it was a, it was living on the bottom of the fraction. So it's a negative power when written on the top, as it were. So this is a reciprocal. 
So it's 3x to the minus a half, because it was x to the half but living on the bottom, plus uh, 2 and x divided by x to the half. So there's really, you could think of there being a 1 there, x to the 1 divided by x to the half. You have to subtract the indices, so 1 take away a half is a half, so you have plus 2x to the half. And this is the version, the rewritten version of what you now are able to differentiate because it's now just a sum of powers of x, which at the moment is the only thing that you're supposed to be able to differentiate. So now I can do dy by dx. So I'm going to focus on this uh, representation of y because it's the easiest version to differentiate. So I times by the power. So 3 times minus a half is minus 3 halves. And then I'd knock one off the power. So minus a half take away an, uh, 1 is taking away 2 halves. So I'm left with minus 3 halves. So I could write it like that. Or I could write it as minus 1.5. Or I could write it as minus 1.5 if I really wanted to. But um, just leaving it like this is probably the easiest thing to do. And then plus... Uh, plus uh, a half times two is one, and then knock one off the power, it takes that down to minus a half. So I gave you full marks if you left it like, <coughs> if you left it like this, or any kind of version equivalent to this. Now, if you want to, you could actually write this back with um, thirds in it and no negative powers. So for example, this is minus three over uh, two times, I guess you could write it as, um, I don't know, the square root of x cubed. I mean, there's a few different ways of writing it. Uh, as I say, you could literally just leave it like this if you want. Um, plus uh, 1 over the square root of x. So it's not immediately obvious that this is the answer that you get uh, by looking at the original question. Right? There is some work to do. Uh, I'm just going to check that I haven't made any silly mistakes. So minus three, yeah, that's exactly how they've written it in the answer. So there you go. And then lastly, number three. So I might have to introduce a new page for this. So I might do that now quickly. Uh, right, so let me just take a quick screenshot, paste it here. Right, there you go. So now we've got all this room for this one. So. Um, when you have a division and when you have brackets, at the moment we have to expand all this out and then do the division, otherwise we can't differentiate it. So let's first of all expand the top. So x times 2x is 2x squared. I've got minus 4x plus 1x is minus 3x and minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. So that's what I have on the top. And then on the bottom is x to the 4. Now I had one person who now went ahead and differentiated the top and then separately differentiated the bottom and left that as their answer. That is not how you do this. This is not how you've been shown how to do this. It's really important to remember that the derivative of, of a fraction is not the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. I'm afraid it does not work as simply as that. So you can't just do that. You have to actually do this division. So x squared over x to the 4, that's 2x to the minus 2. Minus x over x to the 4 is x to the minus 3. So I'm literally just doing the index take away 4 each time. And then minus 2x to the minus 4. And now it's in the format that I can differentiate. If, you, if your function, especially right now in year 12, where you haven't actually met any new functions that you're able to differentiate, you can't differentiate unless it's written as just powers of x being added up. They can be negative and they can be fractions, but you shouldn't really have any brackets or any uh, division going on. Okay, So that's really important to try to remember. So anyway, now I can do dy by dx. That's, uh, that's the point. So minus 2 times 2 is minus 4 and knock one off the power. Minus 3 times minus 3 is plus 9 and then knock one off the power, and then minus 4 times minus 2 is plus 8, x to the minus 5. So that's, uh, that's the answer. You could also now write it as minus 4 over x cubed, plus 9 over x to the 4, plus 8 over 
x to the 5 if you really wanted to. You, you, could, you could even now find a common denominator times top and bottom by x squared times top and bottom by x. Write the whole thing as a fraction just like how the original thing was written but honestly you don't need to you don't need to do this. This uh, leaving it just like this is is fine. But uh, it's also nice to think of it like this as well. Okay, so that was question one. If you have any further questions, you must email me. I'm just going to say it now. I did. I have had one person send me an email before about two or three weeks ago, something like that, and they start with "Hi, sir. Sorry to bother you, but." And then they ask their question. I'm just going to say, look, it really is no bother to email me. Really isn't. I actively encourage you to try the work. If you get stuck, and you've really tried hard, and you've you know worked up until a certain point, and you can be specific about what you're stuck on, please email me or any maths teacher. To be fair, it doesn't have to be me. I mean, I'm probably the given that I'm the one teaching you about differentiation, it's the topic I'm doing at the moment, I would advise you to email me in the first instance about this work in particular. But please do not worry about sending an email to ask for help. Okay, seriously. Uh, it's no bother whatsoever. Okay, question two. Okay, uh, given that x, so this is x is a function of u, so and this is, a, it's a little bit strange, right, because we're used to y being a function of x. But we can choose any letters we want. We could have t as a function of r, we could have a as a function of b, and we could have dA by dB. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. It's just we're so used to y as a function of x that this maybe looks a little bit strange. But anyway, it's x as a function of u, and the only way we're going to differentiate this is by expanding it out. So I'm just going to do a very quick grid method. So 3u and 2, and u squared and minus 3. So this is 3u cubed, 2u squared, minus 9u and minus 6. So we actually have that x is 3u cubed plus 2u squared minus 9u minus 6. So to find d2x by du squared, I must first find dx by du. So 3 times 3 is 9 and knock one off the power. 2 times 2 is 4 and knock 1 off the power and then this is just, well the derivative of what's left is minus 9 so you could just think of it like that if you want and uh, then I must remind uh, I must remind you the, the second derivative is not this thing squared okay I know it kind of looks like it but it isn't it's not the same thing, you don't, you don't now square this you differentiate this again okay so you have to do d by dx of dx by du. Ah, sorry about that. Little mistake. I am so used to doing dy by dx myself that this should have been a d by du. So my apologies about that. So dx by du. And that's what's d2x by du squared. And this is kind of where the notation comes from. It's like I'm doing d by du of something. That is where the d squared comes from. It's just notation at the end of the day. It just means differentiate again. d squared x, and then they write it as du times du. Of course, it's not really du times du. It's just notation. But that's that's kind of where the notation comes from. So I have to do d by du of 9u squared plus 4u minus 9, which is, of course, 18u plus 4. And that's my final answer. Okay, again, any questions about that, send an email. Right, number 3. So we've got a cubic. Find the equation of the tangent of the curve at P, which is the coordinate 2 minus 3. So let's do part 1 first. So uh, the coordinate... is 2 minus 3. I also am going to need the gradient. So that's what I need in order to get the, well that's y equals mx plus c. I need the m and then I use the coordinate to get the plus c. So how I get this is to work out dy by dx. So that is 6x squared minus 6x minus 8 and then dy by dx when x is 2 
is six times two squared minus six times two minus eight. So I'm just gonna use calculator for this. So six times two squared minus six times two minus eight. So the derivative is four. So that means uh, instead of this question mark, we now actually know it's four. And so we're now good to go because I now use y equals mx plus c. I know that m is four. So I've got y equals four x plus c. And I know what one of the coordinates is, right? So I know that y is minus three when x is two. So eight plus something is minus three, that must make c minus 11, right? So it's y equals four x minus 11. Right, and then I'm definitely going to need a new slide to do part two. <clears throat> so part two. Find the coordinates of the point Q at which the tangent is parallel to the tangent at P. Um, just to illustrate, so I, I can do this without showing you this, but I'm going to show you this anyway. Let's, um, I'm going to go on desmos.com. I'll take a little screenshot. So I've got Y, and you can do this as well. I mean, you were sad at home, right? So you, you, could, you can go on desmos.com. It's quite good for, uh, for questions to do with graphs. So, um, got my picture of my cubic there, and then I'm going to type in y equals 4x minus 11, and I'll take a little screenshot and you can have a look. <clears throat> so the, the red line is y equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 8x plus 9, so I just type that into Desmos, and the blue line is y equals 4x minus 11. Yeah, y equals 4x minus 11. And as you can see, at x is 2, if you look very closely, it's down there at minus 3, and that's exactly where it touches. And what we're looking for is, well, we want to find a point Q on this graph where we've got another tangent line that's exactly parallel to this tangent line. So just by looking, it the only place it really looks like it can be is about here. Let me just try to draw that again. I mean, it's... Right, if you think about it, that's it's like parallel there and there. So it looks like it's going to be about here. Now, of course, how would I do this without utilizing Desmos? Well, I know that at the point Q, the gradient is 4. So at Q, the gradient is 4. Okay, so the gradient is 4 at this point. It's, I mean, it's also the gradient is four here as well at P. Okay, so maybe I'll just do it here, like this, right? In fact, we know it's exactly there. That's where P is, right? So at Q and also to be fair at P, the gradient is four. But what was the gradient again? So the gradient was six X squared minus six X minus eight. So this means instead of writing the, this down, I'm going to write 6x squared minus 6x minus 8. And instead of is, I'm going to write equals. And instead of, okay, well, as well as 4, I'm going to write 4. And this is going to be a quadratic, which has two, which is probably going to have two solutions. And we know it's going to have two solutions because one of them is going to give us this one down here. And one of them is going to give us probably this one around, around about here. Okay. So, now we're going to solve this, so I guess I'm going to take away 4 and divide everything by 6. So that's going to be x squared minus x minus 2 is 0, right? So if I take away 4, that's minus 12, and then divide that by 6 is minus 2. And I know that one of the solutions is x is going to be x is 2, because I, I mean I already know that one. So I know it, it definitely factorizes as x minus 2 and then I guess it has to be x plus 1 to give me this. And if you check, look, 1x minus 2x gives me the minus x. So it's definitely this. Okay, so x either equals 2 <coughs> or x equals minus 1. Uh, the x equals 2 one, that's uh, where p is. 
Yeah, that's where p is. Uh, the x equals minus 1, if you look, it actually literally looks like about minus 1 where I've drawn it there. I mean, I know it's not the easiest thing to see, but it looks about there, right? And so we just have to figure out what the coordinate is when x is minus 1. So uh, when x is minus 1, we have to figure out what y is. So let me bring this back up. Uh, in fact, we, we have the y up here, actually. So let me bring the calculator up and do 2 times minus 1 cubed minus 3 times minus 1 squared minus 8 times minus 1 plus 9. And just looking, it looks like it's going to be about 12. Now, if you look, minus 1, go up, it was about there, it looks about 12. And in fact, it is exactly 12. Right, okay. So when x is minus 1, y is 12. And so the coordinate is minus 1, 12. Okay, so that's the coordinate q. All right. So uh, just, just to recap that, we, we found out the equation of the tangent to the curve at p. Uh, we did that by differentiating, pu putting in x is 2, working out that the derivative was at that point was 4, so that's how steep it was there. So that was the gradient, it was 4. That's what the gradient of the tangent line would have to be, and then you just use the coordinate 2 minus 3 to figure out that it must be the point, uh, it must be the line y equals 4x minus 11. So that's that blue line that I've drawn there. And then it's saying uh, there's another point on this red on this red curve, this uh, y equals 2x cubed minus 2x squared minus 8x plus 9. There's another point where the tangent line will be parallel to the tangent line at p. But that literally means the gradient there has to be 4. So you're setting up a little equation that the gradient has to be 4. So you figure out the gradient, it's 6x squared minus 6x minus 8, because that's what dy by dx is, and you're making that equal 4. You get two possibilities, one of them was the one we already knew about, and the other one was the one you're, you're looking for in the question, right? Because it's clearly not this one, this was the, this was the one we were given, so it, it's this one. And uh, the coordinate where, where q has to be is when x is minus 1, so the coordinate is minus 1, 12. You figure out the 12 by plugging in minus 1 into y. Okay, again, any questions, please send me an email. Right, number 4. Find the equation of the normal to the graph y equals x minus 2 over x squared at the point where x equals 1. Okay, so number 1, we're going to write y equals x minus 2x to the minus 2. Uh, we're going to differentiate that. So dy by dx is 1 plus 4x to the minus 3. And when I set x equals 1, I get 1 plus 4 times 1 to the minus 3. Because <clears throat> of bid mass, I'll actually do that first. So that's just 1. So it's 1 plus 4, which is uh, 5, right? So dy by dx is 5. So therefore, the gradient of the normal because uh, remember the normal is perpendicular to the tangent and this was what the gradient of the tangent would be so this would be the um, tangents gradient uh, when x is 1. The gradient of the normal is uh, the negative reciprocal of this right so it's negative a fifth. <clears throat> so let's just see can I squeeze it in here let's have a look. So I've got y equals negative a fifth x plus c. When x is 1 on the original graph, so let's figure out what the coordinate is. When x is 1, y is going to be 1 take away 2, so minus 1. So let me say that again. You need, you need the coordinate, right? Otherwise, you don't know how to get plus c. So when x is 1, it's 1 take away 2 times 1 which is just 1 take away 2, which is minus 1. So it's minus 1 equals minus a fifth times 1 
plus c. So if I'm already, this is just minus a fifth and I need to get down to minus one. So I guess c has to be minus four fifths. So c is minus four fifths. Otherwise you don't uh, get down to minus one. So your final answer, which I can fit in here because I'm not going to bring the calculator up. Final answer is y is minus a fifth x minus four fifths. <clears throat> right, now I'm definitely going to need another slide in order to answer the next one. <laughs> okay, so show that the normal does not meet the curve again. Now, I'm just going to use Desmos again. Um, not sure why it's doing that, but anyway, whatever. Can I, will it go, go away? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to use Desmos again to actually plot these two graphs and, sh and show you what's going on. So again, you wouldn't necessarily have this opportunity in, a, in an actual exam question, but while you're learning and having a look at what's going on, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a per it's a good idea. You should get used to using Desmos. So it's y was minus a fifth x minus four fifths. And I'll take a little screenshot. Right, so the red line is what uh, y equals x minus 2x squared, a 2 over x squared looks like. So let me write this on. So this is y equals x minus 2 over x squared. And then this straight line is our, is our normal which is y is minus a fifth x minus four fifths. Now, as you can see, um, this was the point where they were supposed to cross, right? Do you remember it was one minus one? Do you remember that one minus one? So that's, that's where they cross. And the idea is, is if you draw a tangent line, which uh, if I can do this, if I can put a straight line in, the gradient of that would be one along five up instead of uh, five along, one down. And you can see if you, uh, let me make that a little bit thicker. So as you can see, this blue line that I've just put, although I make it a different color because the other one's blue. Uh, can you see it if I make it green and make it a bit thicker again like I did before? Okay, so this green line is the tangent line at that point, which, which has gradient five. As you can see, it goes one along five up. I mean, we literally figured out that it had great gradient five, right? That's what we did. And um, the normal crosses at right angles to this green line. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's obviously a little bit on a, on a bit of a wonky angle. The whole thing's been sort of rotated a bit. But if you think about it carefully, this is one along five up and this is five along one down that angle there is uh, 90 degrees so this is this is the normal at that point right because it's a right angle to the tangent at that point so let me just uh, get rid of that let me um get rid of this and finally let me make this a bit smaller so Show that the normal does not meet the curve again. Well, looking at it graphically, we can see with our eyes that it only meets it in one place, but we have to show this and we're gonna to have to use algebra to show this. So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna set these two things equal. So we're gonna have x minus two over x squared, which is the red line, has to equal minus a fifth x minus four fifths. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we need. And so the very first thing I'll do to tidy this up is times everything by five. So this is five X minus 10 over X squared is now just equal to minus X minus four. And now I'll tidy up by timesing everything by X squared. So this is five X cubed minus 10 equals minus X cubed minus four X squared and now I'll make it all equal zero because that's uh, normally quite a good strategy. So five X cubed plus an X cubed will be six X cubed. So I could have done that in one go there. So that's six X cubed plus four X squared 
minus 10 equals 0. And then what I'll do is I will divide everything by 2. So I've got 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5 equals zero. So this is where most people actually got up to. They got up to this. This was now worth two out of five because the rest of it is now to show that this only has one solution. And it's not enough just to say, oh, when you make x equal one, this works. Oh, right, therefore, it's the only solution. It's like, no, there's some more work to do. Okay, there's some more work to do. So the way you want to show that this only has one solution is to first of all think to yourself, well, I know that one is a solution to this. I know that one is a solution to this. <clears throat> so um, that means that x minus one is a factor. It means this cubic would factorize as x minus one times a, a sum quadratic. Now, if you haven't done um, the factor theorem to do with um, polynomials yet, then you then to be fair, you might not have known this, um, which which is totally reasonable to, to not already know this. But I'm, I'm kind of telling it telling it you now, um, just within the context of this question. Since we know x is one is a solution, so um, let me write it in a different color. So because x is 1 is a solution uh, or root um, we have x minus 1 is a factor uh, so don't worry too much about this yet if you haven't seen this in the other part of the book uh, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll be coming on to it quite soon, I should imagine. So don't don't worry too much about it. Uh, it's uh, it just means that the x minus one will will be form part of how you factorize this cubic. And if this is linear, what would I need to times it by to get a cubic? Well, it's going to have to be a quadratic. Okay, so <clears throat> you've again you've either done polynomial division yet or you haven't i'm going to assume that you haven't so i'm just going to show you how you can figure out what the quadratic is and um, if you have done it then what you could then what you would do is you would do this cubic divided by this x minus one and you would get your quadratic as, as your answer for doing that now i can't off the top of my head remember if you'll have done this yet but again don't worry if you haven't because i'm just going to show you how to do this uh, without using that method okay so we know it's x minus 1 times something is 0 now let's have a look at what it would need to be how are we going to get 3x cubed what would need to be here to get 3x cubed given that there's only an x here well after some thought you might establish it has to be 3x squared that needs to be 3x squared here. Otherwise, when you expand this out, you're not going to end up with 3x cubed. We don't actually, off the top of our head, know straight away how many x's this is going to be. But there is something we can do to figure out what the number at the end has to be. It would have to all multiply out. So you could imagine doing a grid method. There would be an x and a minus 1. And there would be this 3x squared, some number of x's that we don't know yet, and a number... And the number times minus 1 would have to give minus 5. So that means it has to end with a plus 5. Right, it has to end with a plus 5. That, that's the only way of it, it expanding out and being minus 5 here. And now what you do is work out how many x's you're going to need in order to end up with... Um, well, for example, to end up with 2x squared. And then I guess you can, you know, you can double check by making sure you end up with the right number of x's as well. So let's have a look. How many x squareds do we currently have? Well, we're going to have, if I do this times this, I'll have minus 3x squared. <clears throat> I'll have minus 3x squared. The only other place I'm going to get x squareds from would be this x times whatever this is. So given that I end up with 2x squared after I simplify everything, this has to be plus 5x. And the reason for that is, is that one gives you 5x squared, 
This one gives you minus 3x squared, and I'm left with 2x squared. And then I guess as a double check, we're just going to check to see if we end up with zero x's, right? Because you see um, we don't have any x's in this cubic. So let's have a look then. Well, where do I get my x terms from? I have, uh, let me use a different color. So the orange is going to be where my x's come from. So I'm going to have 5x and I'm going to have minus 5x and that cancels out to be no x's. So it works. The cubic is really x minus 1 brackets 3x squared plus 5x plus 5. <clears throat> so let me write that down. So it's x minus 1 brackets 3x squared plus 5x plus 5. Now if you did polynomial division, this is what you should end up with as your answer. Don't, don't worry if you haven't done that yet though. Um, and, and clearly in class or in a separate video or whatever it ends up having to be, I could go into more detail about this. Uh, hopefully you followed along how I worked out what the quadratic was. You're just comparing coefficients and uh, kind of working out what it would need to be. It's a little bit of trial and error, uh, to be fair. So anyway, um, so either x minus 1 is 0, which gives you the x is 1, which we know about, or... 3x squared plus 5x plus 5 is 0. Now, since we're supposed to show that the normal doesn't meet the curve again, it's quite likely that this quadratic doesn't actually have any solutions. And so we just need to show that this quadratic doesn't have any solutions. So the easiest way to do that is to show that b squared minus 4ac is negative. So you check what the discriminant is. So b squared minus 4ac is uh, 25 minus 4 times 3 times 5, which is, of course, uh, negative, isn't it? So uh, that's 12 times is 60, 25 take away 60 is minus 35. So that's minus 35. Sorry that I'm kind of squeezing it in here. Um, hopefully you can still see it. But since that's uh, less than 0, I won't write any more, I'll just say it. Since the discriminant for that quadratic is less than zero, that part there can't actually equal zero. And so therefore the only way that this cubic ever equals zero is if x is one. And that's how you show that the only solution is x is one. Okay, you don't just you don't just kind of hope for the best, right? There's some there's some more work to be done. And uh, the way you want to do it is, I mean, I emailed people back with uh, with some instructions about that, and I've also now gone through it. So again, what I'll say is, any further questions, anything like that, please just get in touch, okay? Hopefully everyone followed that. Please don't worry if you didn't. It's very hard to know because there's no way of getting any direct feedback. I don't know if I've gone too fast or gone too slow, included too much or too little detail. So please do let me know if there's anything else you need me to say. Right, now on to the lesson. So what I'm hoping is, and what you should have done, is you should have watched the previous video. You should have made notes. You should know what a stationary point is and you should know how to classify stationary points by using the second derivative test. You know that if the second derivative of that point is negative, then you've got a maximum. And you know if the second derivative at that point is positive, then you've got a minimum. Because you're in year 12, the second derivative test will not fail for you. But because I wanted everything together in one video so that you can access it in the future, I did talk about what, what else could happen and what happens when the second derivative test fails. So that's what I assume you've done. I also assume that you've done exercise 4.5a. I assume that you've done the questions, you've checked the answers at the back. If you're not getting them right, or you're really struggling, you've emailed me for help. But since no one's done that, my assumption is, is everyone's totally fine. And we're ready to sort of continue with this section and talk about exercise 4.5b. But I thought what I would do before doing that is go through question seven of exercise 4.5a. So if you have already done this and got it right, then again, 
check out the timestamp in the description and just go to the next part of the video. If you haven't already tried this, then on, then why not would be my first question. And then the instruction would be try it before you watch me go through it. So I'm about to go through it now. Okay, number seven. A function is defined by f of x is ax plus 72 over x and x is positive. Show that the only stationary point on the curve y equals f of x is at x equals 3. So I'm going to write y equals 8x plus 72x to the minus 1. I write it like this automatically, to be honest, because I know I'm going to have to differentiate it. So dy by dx is 8 minus 72x to the minus 2. And I want this to equal 0 at a stationary point. So I'm solving an equation 8 minus 72 over x squared is 0. So this is, this is what I need to solve. So I'm just going to enter another blank slide to continue this question. Okay, so I've got 8 minus 72 over x squared is 0. So I'm going to times everything by x squared. So I've got 8x squared minus 72 equals, well, 0 times x squared is still 0. Um, I'm going to divide everything by 8. So that's an okay thing to do. So x squared take away 9 is 0. So you can either, I mean, there's two ways now of solving this. You could factorize it and write x minus 3 x plus 3 is 0. So either x is 3 or x is minus 3. Uh, alternatively, what you could do is you could say x squared is 9 and then take the square root. And remember that x could be plus or minus the square root of 9, which is 3. So it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. But remember, x is greater than 0. So because x is greater than 0, x is only equal to 3, right? That's the idea. Okay, state the coordinates of the stationary point and determine its nature. Um, right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just enter another blank slide. So again, if I'm going too fast, right, you can pause, you can rewind. So, you know, you've got all that functionality, I'm sure. So uh, we've done that. State the coordinates of the stationary point. So I've got to do 8 times 3 plus 72 over 3. So uh, just quickly use the calculator. 8 times 3 plus 72 over 3 is 48. <clears throat> right, so the coordinate is 3, 48. And we also have to determine its nature. So if we recall, uh, dy by dx was equal to, what was it, 8 minus 72 x to the minus 2. Uh, yeah, that's right, <coughs> isn't it? Yeah, 8 minus 72 x to the minus 2, yeah. So I need to do d2y by dx squared. So that's now uh, nothing. And minus 2 times minus 72. So that's going to be positive, I guess, 144. So 0 plus 144 x to the minus 3. So evaluating that when x is 3, I only really need to show that it's positive, and of course it will be, um, but let's uh, let's just make sure we've got the answer. So 144 times 3 to the minus 3 is 16 over 3, which is positive, so uh, therefore it's a minimum. And it's at this point, to be honest with you, I want to just double check that I'm not making any silly mistakes. So let me just uh, load up the answers. So um, yeah, hope everyone's all right. Hope everyone's following what I'm doing. Uh, if not, you do need to make sure you get in touch. Kind of can't stress that enough. I keep going on about it because people aren't and either everything's really fine, everything's almost, you could call it too easy, or actually you're not, you're just choosing not to get in touch, which uh, kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
Uh, okay, just as a minimum at 348, right? Okay, so we're just going to go right ahead and uh, assume this is true, right? Because it doesn't tell you any more information in the back of the book. Um, just says it's a minimum. So we're right about it being a minimum. Hopefully I haven't made any silly mistakes with the actual working, but uh, we're correct that it is indeed a minimum and it was 348. So uh, there you go. Okay, so um, we've now got the related function defined by this, but now it's just x doesn't equal zero. And of course, x can't equal zero because I, I can't divide by zero. And it says it has a stationary point at x equals minus three, determine the nature of this stationary point. Well, it's, it has the same derivative and it has the same second derivative. So now I'm just gonna do 144 times minus three to the minus three which is going to give me, well, it's going to give me minus 16 over three, isn't it? Because the only difference there is it's a negative, which is of course less than zero, so it's a maximum. And then all it says is it's a maximum, right? There you go. So that's that one. And that was question seven. So that was in principle, that was the hardest question of exercise 4.5a. So hopefully that's been okay. Right, now we're gonna turn our attention to page 109. So example three, so there's actually a worked example in the book. So this is a, a cubic. You can tell it's gonna be a cubic because it's three linear terms and it says show that the curve crosses the axis here. So uh, for part A, so I'm gonna go through this question, but of course you can also look at the working in the book as well and you can compare it to what I do. So um, given that we're gonna to have to differentiate this, I'm going to expand this now and I'm just going to cheat. So um, if you've not ever heard of a website called Wolfram Alpha, it's definitely something you want to uh, check out. So just to be quick about it, when you expand this out, you get so y is x cubed plus 9x squared minus 120x minus 700 and when y is z and when x is 0 you get minus 700 uh, so that's you know as required so so it crosses the y axis when x is 0 and uh, that happens and when that happens y is minus 700 so uh, we've we've done that so show there's a maximum turning point here and a minimum turning point there. So we're gonna to have to do dy by dx. So this, I guess this is part B. So dy by dx is three x squared plus 18x minus 120. And this has to equal zero at a stationary point. So divide everything by three, you have x squared plus six x minus 40 is zero. And I guess this factorizes as x minus four x plus 10 is zero. So there's a stationary point at x is four and at x is minus 10. And so I'll just plug four into my original function. When I do this, I'm, I'm gonna get minus 972 so you can verify that with your calculator if you want. So when you put four in, you get minus 972. And when you put minus 10 in, you're gonna get 400. Okay, that's just me plugging it back into this. And then it says, okay, sketch the curve. So let me just quickly sketch it here. So it crosses the Y axis down here at minus 700. Uh, let me put that this side. It uh, has a maximum turning point at minus 10, 400. So if I go along to minus 10, uh, you could say that that's about there. So that's minus 10, 400. So that's gonna be a maximum. Ah, hang on a second. I have actually missed a little part out. We need to show that it's a maximum and show that it's a minimum. So uh, just to quickly do that, 
See, I'd have lost marks in the exam if I'd, if I'd uh, forgotten to do that. Thankfully, I remembered. So d2y by dx squared is, remember I'm using this, so this is 6x plus 18. <clears throat> and when you do x is minus 10, um, well, that's minus 60 at 18, that's a negative, so it's a max as we want. And when you put x is 4 in, well, it's going to be positive, isn't it? So it's a minimum. So we've done that. I mean, we've done it in a little bit of a rushed way. I mean, if I was doing that properly, I would show all the answers and show all the working. But anyway, it's definitely a maximum here. So that's the top of a hill. And then at 4 minus 972, so it actually goes to about here. So this is minus 972 down here. And this is uh, 4. And then we also know where it crosses the axis as well, the x-axis. So it crosses at 10, it crosses at minus 5, and it crosses at minus 14. So it's going to come up, go down, go down through there, and then there's the minimum there, and then it's going to come back up like that. So notice what have I done here. It's gone through the y um, intercept as we wanted. It's got the maximum and the minimum in the right place as we want. And it also has all the correct x intercepts. So how do I know what the x intercepts are? Well, I, I, uh, I just set this thing equals zero. I want to know when y is zero for the x intercepts. So that happens when x is 10, when x is minus five, or when x is minus 14, okay? Right, so that's that one. And then on page 110, we start to look at maximization and minimization problems, which is the kind of next part of uh, the turning point section. So uh, if you have a look, for example, at example four, it says we've got a piece of rope and it's 120 meters long. It's uh, gonna be used to draw a rectangle on the ground. And it says, what's the biggest area that can be enclosed in the rectangle? So if you, if you think about this, there are lots of possibilities, right? For example, you could have 20, and you would know that this is 20, and then that's 40 altogether, 120 take away 40 is 80, and halved is 40. And so then your area is 800. Uh, for example, I could have 10, 10, uh, so this would be 50 and 50 and this area is 500. So this one already has a bigger area. What The idea is, is we're trying to figure out which, what, what are the dimensions that's going to give us the biggest area. Is the biggest area actually 800 or is it something even bigger? So we have to have some way of figuring this out. So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna draw a little picture, x and x. And I guess, what's this? That, that adds up to 2x. Um, so altogether, these add up to 120 minus 2x. So if you halve that, because they've both got to be the same, you'll have 60 minus x and 60 minus x. And if you look, actually, this is, this is what it is. I mean, when x was 20, we had 60 minus 20. When x was 10, we had 60 minus 10. So x, we can vary it around, right? x can go between uh, 0 and 60, actually. When x is 0, you've got a, you've got a you, well, you haven't really got a rectangle, obviously. You've just got a flat line. But it's like 0 tall and a 60 wide. And it's like 0, 60, 0, 60. You'll have 0 area. You could have 60 tall and 0 wide. So that's a possibility. Um, but both of those is going to have zero area and not even really be rectangles. How are we going to work out what value of x makes this have the biggest possible area? Well, we're going to set up a little equation that the area is, of course, x times 60 minus x, which is 60x minus x squared. So that's what the area of this is. It's 60x minus x squared. And then I want to try to find the maximum of this. I want to try to find the maximum that this can be. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to differentiate this. I'm 
and I'm going to make that equal zero because at zero we're going to have a stationary point. So if you notice this solution is x is 30. You might take, add the 2x and half, you get x is 30. And that should make some amount of sense, by the way, that this would be 30 and this would be 30 and you'd have the area of a square. So it's actually, uh, it's a, it's a well-known fact that for a given perimeter, the uh, quadrilateral that maximizes the area is a square, okay? Now, how do we actually know that this is a maximum? Because it could, it could it, without, uh, without doing this last part, it could be a minimum. I mean, we know it isn't a minimum, but we have to check. So the thing we'd have to do, and apologies for this, that I'm kind of going up the page, but anyway, it, it doesn't matter. So I've kind of gone from there to there, and now I actually have to go up here. I have to do d2a by dx squared. That is just minus two. So notice how e, no matter what I did, uh, that's negative. So my value is a, uh, a maximum. Okay, and the questions in exercise 4.5b are all kind of similar to this. You have to think about, uh, and it, it tells you the strategy, it, it, it gives you some examples in the book, uh, and it gives you nice full work. And, uh, but the exercises that you would move on to next, and if you're in on Thursday, to be fair, if well, th this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because if you are in on Thursday, but you've already done exercise 4.5b, well, we might have to move on to something else. But maybe if you haven't already done exercise 4.5b, then uh, that's what we would have been doing on Thursday. So it's the situation is a little bit complicated because it's not immediately clear what Thursday is going to look like. But I've made this video now. I'm going to put it up, going to tell you what your homework is and um, allow you to work through exercise 4.5b in your own time. So this is this is exercise 4.5b. Um, so they're all kind of phrased a little bit more complicated than how they would have been phrased in exercise 4.5a. Exercise 4.5a is just giving you, you know, they're, they're telling you what the function is, they're telling you, right, differentiate it, set it equal to zero, and then use the second derivative test. In this, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to kind of work out what the function is first that you need to differentiate, set equal to zero. So, for example, if you look at number one, We've got two numbers, x and a thousand minus x. So if, say for example, x is 50, then the other number would be 950, right? And they add up to make a thousand, of course. So what would they need to be to maximize their product? So their product will be the two numbers times together. So, for, you know, for example, you might set up a little function called p for product and that's going to be x times a thousand minus x and you want to make this as big as possible well you differentiate it and set it equal to zero for a stationary point and then show it's a, and then show it's a maximum Okay, remember, d, uh, setting equal to z, the derivative equals zero doesn't immediately give you a maximum, remember. It gives you a stationary point, and then there's some more work to be done to establish what sort of stationary point it is. Once you've shown it is a maximum, then you've answered the question, because you've shown what they need to be to maximize their product. And then the rest of the questions kind of follow a, a, a similar a similar theme. You should definitely try these. So, so this isn't homework to hand in. Okay, so don't do exercise 4.5b and then send it to me. It's not your homework to give to me, but you should do these questions and you should, you know, check the answers in the back of the book as you're going, make sure you know what you're doing. If you do have any problems or anything that you can't do or don't understand, then feel free to send a photo of your work and then ask for help about it. Of course do that. That would be more, more than welcome. I would actively encourage that. But in terms of what your actual homework is, it's these three questions, which I'll email to you. And you've got to do the same thing as you did before. So either just send me individual photos 
if that's the easiest thing to do but I do prefer it if they maybe come in a word document or something like that just so that it is one file but with with all the photos in but please as, as long as I've gotten the photos of your work that's that's obviously fine I should just point out part of the assignment is to take clear photographs that don't crop any work off I'm not going to award you full marks on a question if part of the question is cropped off Okay, so part of the assignment is actually to make sure the photos are clear. So I'll just I'll just say that. Uh, right, and then that's basically it, everyone. So um, you need to, th over the course of this week, do exercise 4.5b. You need to ask for help if you're stuck. And separate to this, you're either going to bring this in and hand it in, you know, by hand, in person, on in Thursday's lesson, or you're going to email this to me with, um, email me some photos, and then I'll, uh, of course, I'll mark that for you as uh, as quickly as I can. Um, hopefully, uh, all of this has been okay. Uh, if not, uh, I keep saying it, but please send me an email. Uh, and and uh, yeah, anyway, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks very much. Leave a like if this has been useful. And uh, I'll see you next time.